Good morning, Calvary Chapel. Um, let's go ahead and stand and worship the Lord together and uh, just uh, try to focus on the Lord today. And uh, I, I know these songs uh, uh, spoke to me this week, so.
Thank you, Lenny. Joy to have you here to worship on this beautiful September Sunday morning. 
It's exciting to be a, a part of what God is doing in these these times. So much is happening, it's hard to hard to keep track of, isn't it? Listen, I want to thank you for your love and grace and support of Calvary Chapel and your, your prayers. Uh, I, I have some really good news. Uh, I, I've been battling a cancer for over 10 years, and uh, I had uh, some radiation treatments in the month of June and, and, and July, and I just got the report back, and the, uh, the cancer marker is really, really lower than it's been in eight years. And I think uh, by the next time I have my uh, second test uh, in four months, I believe it's going to be completely eliminated. So uh, we're heading the right direction, and I appreciate your prayers, and I give God all the glory. And as I've shared with you all before, God doesn't do things to us. He does things through us. There's always other people and, and nurses and attendants and doctors that he wants us to... Uh, to witness to, to have a, a testimony with, and, and that's been happening. So, but anyway, thank you so much for your prayers. Um, I live to fight another day, so praise God. <clears throat> Periodically along the way, when you get a little bit older, you wonder, well, is, is, is God finished with me now? Is it time for me to, uh, to dial back? That's happened a couple times, and, and each time the Lord says, I didn't say anything about being finished with you yet. I'll let you know when I'm finished with you. So, so thank you so much for your encouragement and, and your prayers. I got word this morning that several Calvary chapels out on the West Coast, uh, Oregon and, and Washington and California, are not able to meet because of the fires, because of the smoke. I'm going to lift them up. Uh, on the other hand, good news in the southern part of, the, uh, of Southern California uh, Jack Hibbs baptized a thousand people at Corona Del Mar in the ocean yesterday. He and he and his staff, a thousand people. So I mean, Jack is one of those churches that are just thriving and, and having revival and, and renewal, and uh, such an encouragement to other churches also. Uh, it, most of you know I know Jack personally. We we text back and forth from time to time, and and so he's been an encouragement to to our fellowship here as well. So. So it, it, we can rejoice with what's going on in some of the churches, and uh, we, we lift up the others in prayer. In fact, let's do that right now. Father, we come before your throne of grace, and we lift up those churches, not just Calvary chapels, but many others who are suffering because of the fires and, and the smoke, uh, not able to meet. We just pray for your grace to sustain our brothers and sisters in Christ who are going through some real tough times there on the West Coast. And we pray that you uh, minister to them and, and through them uh, as, as best as you possibly can in, in light of the circumstances. And I know that all, all those ministers want to be out ministering to people. And uh, I know that they'll find a way to do that somehow, some way. So we pray for your extra grace for what's going on out there. We rejoice with the good things that are happening in other churches throughout the country. Uh, Lord, this is a time where you want to renew us and refresh us and revive us in the midst of the trials, in the midst of the difficulties, and in the midst of the apocalyptic times, Lord God. You want to thrive in us and through us. So we thank you and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, grab your Bibles and turn to the book of Revelation. We've been going through the book of Revelation. We're almost halfway through. We started in January. We actually started before the, the whole uh, coronavirus hit America. And uh, then when it hit, it's like, oh my, we're in the right book. I mean, this is just really exciting uh, to see. None of us want to see suffering and none of us like the theme of judgment but, you know, through it all, the Lord is merciful. He's graceful. He has a way of, of doing things that uh, it's be beyond our comprehension. So let's look at uh, chapter 10 here about this mighty angel. So Revelation chapter 10. I'm going to be reading from the New American Standard Bible, if you'll follow along in your translations. 
I saw a strong angel, another strong angel coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud, and the rainbow was upon his head, and his face was like the sun, his feet like pillars of fire, and he had in his hands a little book, a scroll, which was open. He placed it, he placed his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. He cried out with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he had cried out, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. When the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken, and do not write them. Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his right hand to heaven, and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and the things in it, and the earth and the things in it, and the sea and the things in it, that there will be no longer a delay. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished as he preached to his servants, the prophets. Verse 8. Then the voice which I heard from heaven, I heard again speaking with me, saying, Go, take the book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel, telling him to give me the little book. And he said to me, Take, take it, eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. I took the little book out of the angel's hand, and I ate it, and in my mouth it was sweet as honey. And when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And they said to me, You must prophesy again concerning many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Again, Father, we ask that you open up our hearts to receive what the Spirit of God is saying to the truth about the truth in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Chapter 10, this mighty angel. This is an interesting passage of Scripture. It's, it's actually between the sixth and seventh trumpets. There's this interlude. We saw an interlude between the sixth and seventh seal judgments as well. And an interlude is designed to give a divine pause, to fill in the action, to give details. It's a timeout for an exp explanation. Revelation chapter 10, verse 1 through eleven fifteen is this divine parenthesis. During this pause, three significant events take place. First of all, there's this mighty angel and the message from this mighty angel. Second, at the beginning of chapter 11, there's the... Uh, the measuring of the temple, and we'll see that next week, and it relates to Israel. And then finally, there's the ministry of the two mysterious witnesses, and that takes place in this divine interlude. But today, we're going to study this mighty angel and his message here in chapter 10. First of all, we see the appearance of the angel, then we'll see the, the message of, of the angel and, and then the, the assimilation of uh, the message that John is told to actually eat this little scroll that the angel is holding. But let's take a look at verses 1 through 3, the appearance of the angel. Again, let me read these three verses, verses 1 through 3, from the New Living Translation. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, surrounded by a cloud with a rainbow over his head. His face shone like the sun, and his feet were like pillars of fire. And in his hand was a small scroll that had been open. He stood with his right foot on the, land, uh, right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he gave a great shout like the roar of a lion. And when he shouted, the seven thunders answered. So, this angel, 
Angels are prominent in the Bible, and they're especially prominent in the book of Revelation. We, we've seen some of these angels before, uh, and there's a hierarchy of the angelic world. There's the angelic beings of the seraphim and the cherubim. There's angels that are just called mighty angels, like this angel that is in our text today. There's archangels. <clears throat> the only archangel that's mentioned in the Bible is, is Michael. Now, there are other archangels, but Micah has to be the most prominent one because he's mentioned, I think, five times in, in the Bible. Just a, a mighty angel. There are great angels, uh, like the one we're going to describe today. There are a category of angels called watchers. Now, this is a mysterious category of angels, and they're only found in Dan Daniel chapter 4, <clears throat> but they have to be awesome angels. And there are many other angels, too many to, uh, to count. Myriads of, on, on myriads, millions of angels. There's a category of angel that, that, that Gabriel fits in. He's also a, a, a great angel. There's a category of angels that I believe are being activated right now as I speak. They're called the host of heaven. When you see the host of heaven, it's just describing warring angels that are under the mighty authority of God. And I think they, uh, as I mentioned, they're being uh, prepared for battle <clears throat> for what's coming forth. The Bible talks about angels are ministering spirits, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, sent to minister grace to the heirs of salvation. That is, believers in Christ, you and I. They're sent to minister to us. That's amazing uh, that when, when you think that God would send angels to minister to us, to render service. Angels bring... Answers to prayer, according to Acts chapter 12, verses 5 through 10. They help in bringing people to Christ in Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Uh, they encourage in times of danger, Acts chapter 27, verse 23. And they care for God's people uh, when they die. I believe that we do have guardian angels. I believe that there are a few passages that describe our guardian angels. And uh, I can't be dogmatic about this, but I believe that when we die, the, a believer dies, that their angel ha that has been assigned to watch over us, to care for us, escorts us into the presence of, of the Lord. And uh, it doesn't mean that we don't have setbacks, trials, and difficulties. We, we all know it. Um, you've had difficulties. You've had setbacks. You have trials. But God allows these angels to minister to us, to protect us. And sometimes we just really sense his intervention in our lives, and, and it could be that he's uh, using angels to do that. Well, they do protect us. Uh, Psalm 34, 7 says, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him to deliver them. In Psalm 35, verses 4 and 5, interesting passage as I was going over this yesterday. Uh, it says, Let those be like chaff before the wind as the angel of the Lord drives them away. Now, the verse before that talks about evil individuals or a group of individuals trying to harass or even kill believers. In this case, it was David. And so David says... Let those be like chaff before the wind as the angel of the Lord drives them away. I love the New Living Translation of this chapter uh, 35, verse 5. It says, blow them away like chaff in the wind, a wind sent by the angel of the Lord. So in some cases, 
when we're oppressed or threatened, the Lord dispatches his angels to deal with those who harass us. I think this really fits into where we are today and with passages that we've been claiming that God would defeat the schemes of evil that's coming upon our world and coming upon America, coming against the church. I've encouraged you as you read through the scripture, particularly the Psalms and other passages of scripture, that you mark those passages that you can turn into prayers. Because the Lord has given us his, his word as, as a prayer book and promises that we can pray back to the Lord that he would just fulfill those mighty promises. That when hell comes against us, it's going to meet stiff resistance with the word of God. And we're praying against the schemes of those who are trying to attack us or our family or our, our nation. The thief comes to steal and destroy and kill, Jesus said in John 10.10. But I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. We're to pray for kings and for those who are in authority. Why? That we might maintain a quiet and peaceful life. And when we see all the onslaught of evil coming against our nation and against the churches, that's time to to, to wake up. That's, That's time to take our stand and to do battle, spiritual warfare, and pick up our spiritual weapons and use them. I, I think many times we feel like, this is hopeless. We're just so overwhelmed. There's just nothing we can do. Yeah, there is something we can do. We can take the promises of the Word of God. We can pray them back to the Lord. We can pray in the name and through the blood of Jesus and the authority of Christ to stand against the schemes and the wiles of the devil who are coming against us. Look, church, this can be our finest hour. We're in the last days. It's time not to lay down and just wait for Jesus to come back, but it's time to be participants in the kingdom of God. I mean, I I look at Jack Hibbs, I think, wow, that's amazing. He's a fighter. He's using the word of God. He's come against the onslaught of of, of officials that are coming against his, his church. And you know what's happening? God's allowing him to thrive and God's blessing. Well, God's using Jack as an example of what other churches can be. He may not be as large as his. I mean, he's got 2,000 out for his midweek Bible study, 12,000 on a Sunday morning. But look, let's get excited about the things of God while we have time to be excited. So other verses we've been claiming is like of Psalm 33.10. The Lord frustrates the plans of the heathen, the Marxists, the anarchists, the socialists. Well, it doesn't exactly say that, but they come under the category of the heathen. And uh, he keeps them from carrying out their schemes. I believe that. And look, church, America is targeted for defeat, disaster, and destruction. And the only real people that can stand against that is the church of Jesus Christ. That's why he's left us here. Look, when we're out of here, all hell's going to break loose. But we're still here. And so God wants to use us as a source of strength to encourage others around us, but to spiritually recognize that we're in spiritual combat and we've got to use spiritual weapons because it's not just a political battle. It's not just a flesh and blood battle. It's a spiritual warfare. And we've got to use our spiritual weapons against the chaos that's happening in our country. You wonder how certain leaders in certain communities can let certain things go on. How they can defund the police when they really need the assistance of police today. It's like, it's like they're deceived. You're right. They're deceived from darkness from the demonic entities of this world. They're deceived. We need to pray for those who are deceived, that God would remove those spiritual blindfolds so that they can see clearly what's happening and make rational, logical decisions about their communities. We can do that. That's why why we're here. Well, this mighty angel here in, in Revelation chapter 10, he's described as strong, 
He's distinguished from the other four angels that we saw in the previous chapter. The four angels that were bound at the great river Euphrates, they were uh, uh, fallen angels because they, they were bound and they're released for a, a, a time anyway. And they're allowed to escort, to uh, motivate, to encourage these uh, uh, demonic 200 million man army to cross the dried up Euphrates River to participate in the, the War of Armageddon. And, uh, but they're, this angel is distinguished from them. This is not a fallen, this is a mighty angel of God. In Revelation chapter 5, we see another mighty angel who says in uh, Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, Then I saw a strong angel, John says, proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and loose its seals? We see another mighty angel, maybe a couple of them there in it, Revelation chapter 18, that uh, deal with the destruction of Babylon in, in the future. But this angel is awesome. He's a high-ranking, high mighty angel, characterized by splendor, brightness, and strength. In verse 1, we see his realm. He, he comes from heaven. He's a heavenly angel. His clothing, he's wrapped in a cloud, which is a metaphor for the glory of God. His head, there's a rainbow around his head. And this recalls uh, the rainbow around the throne that John saw when he first went to heaven in chapter 4. When he was caught up into heaven, remember, uh, the angel says, come up here, John. And so he, he comes up and one of the first things he, he sees is the throne of God and this rainbow around the throne. A rainbow reminds us that God will never judge the world again through a flood. A rainbow that is seen here in heaven around this angel and also around the throne of God indicates that God is still merciful. Even in the midst of judgment, he's very merciful. And we've already seen in, in the midst of the, the trumpet judgments and, and the seal judgments that there's little pauses to give people time to repent it's a, it's a loving God. His, his characteristics never change. He's still loving. He's still merciful, though he's showing his wrathful side as he pours out his wrath upon planet Earth during the tribulation. There's a wonderful prayer that the prophet Habakkuk prays in uh, Habakkuk, where is that? Habakkuk 3.2. Some people pronounce him Habakkuk, other pronounce him Habakkuk. Uh, anyway, chapter 3, verse 2, he says, Lord, in your wrath, remember mercy. And he always does because he's a merciful God. His, this angel's face is like the sun. It's reminiscent of, of the characteristics of, of Christ described in, in chapter 1. His feet like pillars of fire. His hand is holding a little open scroll, in verse 2. His right foot is set up on the sea, his left foot on the land, and it convey, conveys that this angel is taking possession, or he's laying claim. The angel is declaring that the world no longer belongs to the God of this world, Satan, but God is sovereign the sovereign ruler over the universe, and he's taking back what is rightfully his. So his voice is as a lion's roar. Seven thunder, thunderous voices are crying out like the roar of a lion. Now, who is this angel? How can we define this angel? Well, some interpreters, well, not some, but many interpreters, say that this angel is... Jesus Christ himself, because of the parallels to chapter 1. And that's a possibility. However, I don't think it's accurate. I don't think this angel in chapter 10 is Jesus Christ for several reasons. First of all, Christ is never called an angel anywhere in the New Testament, and particularly in the book of Revelation. Now, he is in the Old Testament. He's called the angel of the Lord. There's a 
theophany where he makes an appearance in the Old Testament as, as the angel of the Lord. But after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, he never appears as an angel again. Uh, the phraseology is used, another angel. And the Greek word uses, uh, it's, it's another angel like the angels that are blowing the trumpets, uh, the trumpet angels. Another of the same kind, a similar nature. Now, this angel in chapter 10 may be more superior in rank and authority than the angels blowing the seven trumpets, but nevertheless, he has a nature of an angel, uh, whereas Christ has a totally different nature. The angel is called mighty, but not almighty. Jesus is the Almighty One. He's the King of Kings and, and the Lord of Lords. So this angel reflects the glory of Christ, but not Christ. He swore an oath to the name of the one who lives forever and ever. So this angel is swearing an oath to someone who is greater than himself. And I believe he's swearing that oath to Jesus Christ and Almighty God. He has an aura of divinity, but he's not divine. Though he's not divine, he's a divine angel working out to execute the plans of God the Father and, and the Lamb. Jesus uses certain angels to represent him in Revelation. And he explains this in chapter 22 of verse 16, where uh, Jesus says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. So, therefore, I don't believe this angel is Christ, but just a, a divine agent, a glorious angel representing and on mission for Christ. Well, the announcement from this angel, verses 4 through 7, the first part of four, verse 4 in the New Living Translation, it says, When the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, Keep secret what the seven thunders said and do not write it down. So we don't know exactly what these seven thunders spoke because he didn't write it down. Uh, we get an idea of what it might be because the thunder has the idea of a storm. A storm is brewing. When you hear thunder, there's usually a storm coming. And there is a mighty storm coming in the rest of the tribulation, and particularly the second half and the latter part of the tribulation, a horrible storm that's coming. So, and you have seven of these thunders, that's a number of, a divine number of completion. So it's a pretty, pretty serious message that he's told not to write down. The second part of verse four says, but I heard the voice from heaven saying, keep it secret what the seven thunders said, and do not write it down. The New American Standard Bible says, Seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken, and do not write them. It's a reminder of Daniel when he was told to seal up his prophecies, because the prophecies for, were for a future time. They will be unsealed at the right time. In fact, I believe Daniel's prophecies are being unsealed today. And the seven thunders that John is told to not write about, I believe they will unfold at the right time as well. Well, uh, we don't know exactly what they are, but perhaps they refer to the seven vile and bold judgments that are yet to come upon planet Earth. I think it's interesting that uh, I know there's some preachers who have sermon titles called The Seven Thunders, and they proceed to explain what they believe are the seven thunders. Nice sermons, except we don't know whether that's accurate or not, because we just don't know what the seven thunders are. He said, don't write it down, so we don't know. Anything that we say about that would be sheer conjecture. But it's a sworn message, because verses 5 through 7 says, New 
uh, Living Translation says, Then the angel I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand towards heaven, and he swore an oath in the name of the one who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and everything in them, the earth and everything in it, and the sea and everything in it. And he said, There will be no more delay. When the seven, seventh angel blows his trumpet, God's mysterious plan will be fulfilled. It will happen just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. When a person raises their hand, and especially when they put their hand on the Bible and swear an oath, that's, that's serious stuff. They're speaking truth. And this angel has raised his hand and he's swearing an oath to the one who is above all, to Jesus Christ. And so he means business. It's a sacred, solid oath that he's making. Verse 6 says, There'll be no more delay. Only by the authority of God could an angel make such a declaration. The timing of everything is in God's hands, especially the latter judgments. He's saying there's going to be no more delay, but when God begins to execute his, his plan, it's going to unfold, and the timing is in his hands. You know, the timing of our lives is in his hands as well. Your birth, your life, your death, that's completely in the hands of the Lord. In fact, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. The good news, as I've shared with you in, in the past, is the latter part of that verse has been canceled for the believer of Christ. We're not going to be judged. Christ has already judged our sins on the cross 2,000 years ago. The believer will experience a, the beam of judgment for, to determine awards, but we won't face the judgment of condemnation. Uh, that's been taken care of at the cross. Those who don't know Christ will face that judgment. But it is a point for us once to die. When is that? We don't know. We hope it's later rather than sooner. And God knows when. And uh, by his mercy and grace, who knows? Maybe we will be that generation that won't taste death. But we'll be that generation that will be transformed from mortal to immortal in the twinkling of an eye at the rapture. I vote for that one. I hope it happens. I'm not a prophet or a son of a prophet. I don't know when Jesus is coming back, but I know this. Every day we live is getting a little bit closer, isn't it? We see indicators all over the place. But his timing is for your life is in his hands. That's why he's worthy for us to trust him with our life. He designed you. He, he created you. He knew when you were born. He had a, a plan for your life. The question is, have we discovered that wonderful plan that he has for our life? If not, let's just surrender totally to him and say, Lord, begin to fulfill that plan. I know his plan involves at least two things, many other things, but two things especially. It involves his word and people because both are destined for eternity. The Lord says, uh, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And people are going to live forever also. They're either going to live forever with the Lord or separated from him for all eternity. And so somehow, some way, our, our plan that he has for our life is to take the word of God and, and somehow live it out. And as we have our opportunity, communicate it to others so that others might come to know him in a personal way as well. Well, the phrase no more delay means that when that seventh trumpet sounds, and we'll see that, we're in this divine pause right now, but when we get to chapter 11, verse 15, that final trumpet is blown, and it contains all the bowls or vile judgments. The angel is giving us a heads up of what's about to take place. When that happens, after the, those judgments, Jesus is going to return for his second coming. He's going to set up his 1,000-year regime on planet Earth known as the Millennial Kingdom. 
And the prayers that we've been praying and the prayers that Christians have been praying since the first century, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's going to happen on earth for the first time. We pray that prayer and periodically we see the will of God done in our lives and our families and our church and even our nation from time to time. But then it will be completely his plan, his purpose, his kingdom with him in charge. So the prayers of Christians, it's a wonderful prayer. I mean, I, I, I pray what's called the Lord's Prayer. It's actually the disciples' prayer on a daily basis. It, it's a great prayer to pray on the fly. You know, when you've missed your devotions or you're in a hurry or, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. And I always say on earth in my, my life, my family, the ministry you've given me, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation. Don't allow us to be led into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Technically, literally, it means deliver us from the evil one, from the devil himself. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Wonderful prayer. Pray that every day. It's kind of a, a capsule form. It's got everything that we need for the day. Wonderful prayer to pray. So when you don't know what to pray, pray the Lord's Prayer. Well, verse 7, Then the mystery of God's plan will be fulfilled just as it's revealed, was revealed to his ancient prophets. Now, we're getting close. Now, we're not in the tribulation. We're not in the book of Revelation. And that's why it's good to take the time to go through the book of Revelation so we see what's coming. It helps us to be discerning. So when you see someone pop off and say, oh, we're in the seventh seal or we're in the seventh trumpet right now. No, we're not. We're not there yet. Why aren't we there yet? Because the church is still here. That's why. These things are not going to unfold until the church is out of here. But we're on a trajectory to these very things that we're talking about today. And we see with Israel new peace agreements with United Arab Emirates and recently this past week, uh, Bahrain, uh, other Arab nations. In fact, I think next week or the week after, uh, they're coming over to America and meeting with the president to sign these agreements with uh, the prime minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu. So we see some things unfolding uh, centered in Israel in the Middle East. And incidentally, Israel is, is the whole he, super sign of Bible prophecy. When you see things happening around Israel, uh, take note. It's important because that means all the other indicators and signs are very, very significant. When we see the unrest, the civil unrest in America and the world, we see the cataclysmic events that are transpiring, the natural disasters we see of earthquakes and fires and pestilences and pandemics. It's like, look, the scripture says we need to be aware that this is just not a normal thing that's happening here. The Lord is trying to get our attention and he's trying to get our attention even here this morning. I love what Luke says in Jesus says in Luke chapter 21, verse 28, it tells us, when these things begin to happen, stand strong. Lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. That is the completion of our salvation is coming to a conclusion. Jesus is about to break through the sky and, and fulfill his prophetic plan. Well, we see the assimilation of this book where, where John is told to eat this book in verses 8 through 11. In verses 8, in the first part of 9, it says, Then the voice from heaven spoke to me again, Go and take the open scroll from the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the scroll 
Yes, take it, he said. Need it. It's like here, little old John come to this mighty angel. Hey, give, give, me, give me that scroll out of your hand. It's like he probably did that with fear and trepidation. But he had the backing of the Lord to do that because this voice from heaven, which is probably Jesus, was telling him, go take that scroll out of his hand and eat it. He tasted the book, verses 9, the second part of verse 9 and 10. He said, this angel said, it's going to be sweet to your mouth. Excuse me, the voice, probably Jesus telling him this, as he gets this book, he's told to eat it. He says, it's going to be sweet as honey to your mouth, but it's going to be bitter to your stomach. So I took the small scroll from the hand of the angel and I ate it. It was sweet to my mouth, but when I swallowed it, it turned bitter in my stomach. I think it's interesting how the Bible uses figurative language to uh, describe the ingesting of the, of the Word of God. Uh, you've read them, beautiful passages like Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 15. Jeremiah says, Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became for me the joy and the delight of my heart. There's something about the Word of God that gives us a delight and a joy, and it is a sweet sensation to our taste. The Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I've tasted and I've experienced, I've seen that the Lord is good. Haven't you? He is good. He's not down on us. He loves us. Even the non-believer, that's why he came. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He loves everyone and he wants everyone to come to, to know him. And when we have come to know him, we really have had the experience of, of seeing how sweet and gracious and kind our Lord really is. Psalm 119, verse 103, David says, How sweet are your words to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. So, um, what a wonderful metaphors that the scripture uses about tasting and seeing and how sweet the word of God is. First Peter chapter 2 verse 2 says, like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the word of God. That's why we encourage you at least sometime during the day, preferably when you start out your day, in the morning, not all of you work a, a shift where you can, you can do that. You have to do it some other time in the day, whether it's in the morning or the afternoon or, or the evening, Take time to read the Bible and let the Holy Spirit speak to you through his word. He has wonderful things for you. It, it feeds your spirit and your, and your soul. And we do need that soul food. <coughs> Not too many of us miss a regular meal. <coughs> Excuse me. Not too many of us miss a regular meal. Uh, and we shouldn't miss our spiritual meal either. It does something to help build our spiritual stamina, our spiritual muscles as well. It gives us the promises and the encouragement and the direction that we need. The Word of God is sweet. But to under unbelievers who are going to undergo the judgment of God, <clears throat> it's very bitter. And that's why God has done everything to keep us from the bitterness that's coming upon the world. And when John eats the book, beautiful promises, wonderful information that's sweet to John, but then it turns sour and bitter in his stomach, and that shows the bitterness of the judgment that's, that's coming. We don't want to see anybody experience the bitterness of, of the tribulation. That's why we teach this. We encourage us to, to pray for our loved ones and pray for those who don't know the Lord and ask the Lord to open up the door that we might share his love with others so that they might come to know Christ as they acknowledge his death, <clears throat> burial, and, and, and resurrection. He says, verse 11 then, he was told to, you must prophesy again about many 
peoples, nations, languages, and kings. So John's work wasn't finished here. He's called to sound the warning about the approaching vile and bold judgments that will uh, be the last of, of the judgments. Many years ago, when my children were small, our youngest, Julie and, and Joey, were about four or five years old, and uh, we had a bottle of aspirin, baby aspirin that we would give the kids back then. I don't think they give aspirin to children anymore like that. I, I, I don't know. I, I've been out of, out of the loop on babies. Uh, uh, I mean, I've got grandbabies, but I don't deal with them the way parents do. But b- back then, they had these orange-flavored aspirin for babies. And... Um, we knew we had used a couple of them for uh, the children, but then we saw the bottle uh, laying out on the table upside down, and it's like it was empty. And so we went to Joey and, and to Julie and said, look, th- this bottle is empty. Did, did one of you children take these aspirins? And, of course, they looked at each other, and they played dumb, like, like kids do. And uh, they weren't going to squeal on each other. But Joey said, she did it. Julie did it. Julie. And she, was, she didn't say anything. And so we rushed her to the emergency room and because uh, we were concerned about, you know, being poisoned. And the attendant there, the doctor in the, in the emergency room, said, yeah, we're going to have to give her something to to pump her stomach, and uh, so they gave her this little uh, jar, a little Dixie cup, full of a juice that was really sweet. Only we knew what was going to happen. So Julie started sipping this. She said, mm, Mommy, this really tastes really good. And in our hearts, we knew what's going to happen. And sure enough, it was sweet for a while, but then it turned terribly bitter, and she just lost her cookies like she was supposed to. So, um, very bitter experience for her, even though it tasted sweet. And I, I, I think of this when John was told to, to eat of this small scroll and realize it's bitter to the, sweet to the taste, but bitter to the stomach. And... Of course, later on, we found out it was Joey all along who did it. It wasn't her. So, he had no problems, but that's the way it goes. But what a joy we have of assimilating the Word of God ourselves. And for the believer in Christ, it is sweet, and it never turns bitter in our stomach, but it, it, it's assimilated and gives us strength. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your Word to us today. We ask for your encouragement uh, from the promises that you give to us. We ask that you continue to unfold this wonderful prophetic book that we might understand it and hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the churches. Father, I ask that you convict those within the sound of my voice who are watching by video or a live stream today that they don't know you, that this would be the time where they would surrender their lives to you. They would acknowledge the the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Come to know Christ in a personal way as they accept his pardon for forgiveness and eternal life. So we thank you. We love you. We bless you. And help us to be sensitive and aware of the possibilities that we might be able to lead others to a personal relationship with you this week. If nothing less, we can pray for people that you would open up their hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? And onward, Christian soldiers. I believe the best is yet to come for the body of Christ. We're still on the hunt. God is not finished with us yet. So let's take those promises and, and, and pray them back to the Lord. In Jesus' name. God bless you.